and welcome to Dregs of Wisdom with Andrew Tanner. <laughs> we are here with Dregs of Wisdom, episode 12. I have a special guest for you today. Her name is Kari Herendorf. She is a certified yoga therapist, a senior yoga teacher, and advanced yoga teacher trainer. She's also a Reiki master, Katona yoga senior instructor, and an Ayurvedic health counselor. She merges the physical and spiritual practice with the health sciences to help her students achieve the highest levels of physical, intellectual, and emotional well-being. Uh, Kari formerly led the 200-hour and 1,000-hour trainings at Kripalu Schools of Yoga and Ayurveda. She's also a master trainer of the Urban Zen Integrative Yoga Therapy Program, and um, she's been really teaching for a long time. <laughs> like me, she used to have a yoga studio in New York City. Um, her studio was the famous East Yoga, um, and she was also the former star of Animal Planet's Canine Karma TV show. We're definitely going to talk about that, um, where she famously merged her passion for animals uh, with a monthly Doga class. I don't know whether she's the founder of Doga or not, but we're going to get and find out. Um, she's been featured in publications including Yoga Journal, The New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Real Simple, and on television for The Martha Stewart Show, ABC News, and Fox and & Friends. Um, so Kari is also a Berkshire native, a friend of mine here in the Berkshires, and we're so happy to have you on, Kari. We're going to get right into it. Very important first question. Um, what were the causes and consequences of the Industrial Revolution? <laughs> Thank you, Andrew, so much for that lovely intro. It was um, it was very nice to be here. Uh, so the consequences of the Industrial Revolution. Well, we could actually the pinpoint the decline of Western world on the chair. <laughs> so we got up off the floor and everything went to pot after that. You can think that that is the reason why our sedentary lifestyles, our bodies are breaking down, digestion, everything is not working because we are just in slump asana all the time. <laughs> oh, very good answer. That, that we, did, we couldn't stump Kari with our first question. <laughs> no one, you know, the, the first few guests on our podcast don't know that the first question is designed to stump you, but good answer. I, I like that. It's, it's a, Thank you. a really true ism that we've gotten out of our bodies um, as technology has increased. So, all right, for real this time, I'm really happy okay. to have you on the show. Your yoga philosophy, um, you know, you talk about on your website about better yoga and about organizing yourself. Um, what is that to you? What is your guiding philosophy when it comes to yoga? Um, well, I think that the, the last time we, uh, when we met for coffee and we're chatting, we were talking about how uh, you, you start teaching and you can't wait to get that first, like, ah, I've been a yoga teacher for five years, right? It's like you're living in New York City for that long. And then it's like 10 years. And then you get to a certain place where, you know, you're, you're fudging it to be like eight years. You're like 10 years. And then you get to a certain place where you're like, oh my God, I've been teaching for 20 years. And then anything over 20, you're still like, I've been teaching for 20 years. <laughs> it's, like, yes. it's like that. And so um, I wouldn't be so bold as to say like my yoga philosophy, but after having been doing this practice and steeping myself or studying from so many amazing, wonderful teachers. I'm, I'm standing on their shoulders for sure. Um, I've been able to garner the best of the best, right? To, to make my, my own philosophy or to have this conglomeration of, of what works. And so my platform, which we called Better Yoga, is, is that which I believe and have seen anecdotally and through research that works for people. So you can do yoga. People have been doing yoga for 10 years. It doesn't mean they're necessarily feeling better hmm. or doing any better in their body and in their lives. And, you know, we can talk about the whole mental health crisis, right? You know, the, the whole body mind connection. But when you, when you do yoga, yoga is not going to fix you. Insight will fix you. And so we do yoga again and again and again to figure out what are our blind spots? Where aren't we going? And, you know, I believe as a teacher, that's the responsibility that I take for everyone that walks into my class, for everyone that walks into my teacher training or into my workshop, right? Because really, at the essence, we all want to be seen. 
We all want to be heard. And I think that it is a, a huge honor, but also a huge responsibility as a teacher of, of any modality, um, that you are responsible for your students and they're trusting you to see something that maybe they don't, right? Otherwise, why go to class? Otherwise, you could just do a YouTube video at home and keep doing the same old thing. It's interesting that you say the purpose of yoga is to experience insight. Can you talk more a little more about that? Like, um, what is the insight that you've seen that you, what are some of the insights that you kind of see students getting along the way? And what do you think is the most important insight? I think it depends on the individual, but uh, one of the most important things is that there's no separation between the body and the mind. And so for them to talk about, or people to talk about, oh, the mind-body connection, mind-body connection, it's like they were never separate. So often when I write it or talk about it, I'll just say the body-mind as if it's one word. Mm. Um, and I think what I've seen in students is the way in <laughs> to changing your mind is by changing the physical body, mm. right? You're never going to have a person who is rigid in their body and liberal is all <laughs> like in their mind, right? <laughs> like how you show up, how you are in life, how you are on the mat is going to be um, how you are in life. And so you can open up a person who's stiff or rigid. It will give permission and will open up something deeper to open up in the mind. And the same thing is true for these flexi bendy, hypermobile people, right? It's like, oh, they're all over the place, right? It's actually, it's actually much easier to, on a yogic level to help someone who's stiffer than it is to contain someone who is sitting in their joints and hanging at the end range of motion all the time. It's like they need a lot more containment. Um, and so what is amazing about yoga, and you can help people by just bringing in the basic tenets of Ayurveda, which is the whole universe is made up of five elements, right? Like some people are so much more air and space, right? They need a little more earth. Um, uh, people that are really earth and water and kind of heavy, well, they need to bring in a little bit more, more fire, right? They need to light a fire under their butt. They need a little bit more air and space. And so you can begin to see and understand bodies. You're going to begin to know what each person needs. And that's how you can teach one group class to 30 different people. And the way you cue it or the way you adjust someone or the, the language that you use, our language is so rich. And by teaching with metaphor it ignites the imagination and so that's why yoga is not just it's like so different than going to the gym and getting a workout because yoga is that trinity of mind body and breath so it's you you know in, you mentioned ayurveda do you feel like ayurveda is kind of necessary for, for yoga teachers or some system of balance um you know that is mind body balancing systems i, I look at like you know, Chinese medicine and Ayurveda are kind of two of the classical mind-body balance systems. I'm sure there are other systems um, that we don't know about, but in yoga, Ayurveda is the big one. Do you think that that is kind of necessary or is it a missing piece for most yoga teachers or is it like, is it needed? Um, is that what makes it the better yoga that it's, and I, I know you're not trying to say I'm better than everyone. I, I know that, but like the is that the thing that you see missing the most? What do you think is missing the most from kind of students who have maybe just practiced yoga at a gym or with maybe a teacher that's only done a little bit of training? Um, so that's interesting. I'm, I'm going to give a quote. I'm going to contribute it to Swami Satchidananda, although I've heard it attributed. I think no matter what school of yoga you're in, it's attributed to that guru, so to speak. Yeah. Um, but on the walls of Yogaville, which was the, his ashram, it said, truth is one. Path, uh, paths are many, right? Mm. And so I think that anything that's going to get you in the door <laughs> of Ayurveda is useful. Anything that's going to get you in the door of yoga is useful. But you can think of, which is why I love, I mean, I love Chinese medicine too, and that is um, really used in Katona yoga. But for me, since doing a deep dive into Ayurveda since 2018, um, it's, it, it's, the, it's the other side of the coin. Right? There's really no yoga without Ayurveda. Hmm. Talk about and that. Can you actually... It, well, you can, you can teach yoga, yoga and... Yeah. A lot of people don't know anything about Ayurveda. Maybe you can just give us a brief 
understanding of that. Right. Well, in your teacher training, you, you know, there's a lot of 200 hour teacher trainings that might have a guest come in and like talk about Ayurveda for a day, right? It's like, it's like 10 hours. They have to have 10 hours of yoga anatomy, which I feel is inadequate, but, <laughs> but it's what it is that there should be a component of Ayurveda because it's the same system. They're born of the same system. And so Ayurveda is, you may have heard it as being described as the sister science of yoga, but it is the ancient medical system of India. And it is the, so this is truly dates back 5,000 years and is the medical model that has been continuously practiced. So it is the oldest form of medicine. And it really is about harmony and balance and balancing great nature, right? With personal nature. You can think about the macrocosm and the microcosm and on a very tangible level, suffering happens when we are not congruent with what is happening outside, hmm. right? And so it's, it is a very empowering system because you are an active participant in your health, which is what I love about it, right? Our, our allopathic Western medicine is very much symptom-based and it's drugs or surgery. And Ayurveda is so elegant and eloquent because it's so simple. Because everything can be broken down to those five elements and the qualities within each one. And I think you had said something before about, you know, yoga and people, you know, we're, we are human beings and we, A, don't like change very much. And we also like to do what we're good at. And so people, they're based on their nature and the word in Sanskrit is prakriti, like your constitution, whatever elements you have more of you will want to stay in that, right? It's like, it's like law of physics. Bodies at rest like to stay at rest. Bodies in motion like to stay in motion. Yeah. And when I used to, when I used to teach back when there were still were yoga journal conferences, right? When we were gathering in person, um, you would see all these certain types of people going to the same classes, right? Mm. The bodies that like to stay at rest were doing restorative. <laughs> they were doing yin. And the bodies that were like, oh, no, 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 they were like, power yoga, vinyasa, do this, do that, you know? And it's like, okay, well, it's all fun and great, but maybe not the best choice if we're really seeking that equanimity and balance. Hmm. And it, I think, you know, maybe I wonder if in the old days you would have had a guru or a teacher that kind of, or a master teacher who works with a student for a long time is going to help them see, Hey, here's where you're imbalanced and, and give them practices that would, you know, help them to become balanced as opposed to now where people kind of come in and out for classes. How do you, mm -hmm. you know, in this modern age, I know you have a whole digital studio. How do you work with your students to kind of help them achieve balance in that way? Um, so, you know, uh, COVID was, wonderful for me in the way in which I started my online business literally March 20th. <laughs> so like two days after, you know, Kripalu closed on the 12th or 13th. They let us finish up. Our, I was teaching in the yoga therapy program. Uh, they let us finish up to Saturday. I taught my last public class on Sunday and I taught my first Zoom class that following Tuesday. And since that day to today, um, I've just grown my online business. But what was so wonderful, because having taught different yoga teacher trainings with Yoga Shanti and Colleen Sadman and Rani Yi, I had students all over the Northeast, right? It was where mm -hmm. concentrated. And just by sending out an email or from word of mouth, suddenly I had all these people in my class that I hadn't taught in 10 years. They maybe took a teacher training with me 10 years ago or um, used to go to my studio. I had people come that used to go to my studio East in, in New York City. Like, which I opened in 2004. Um, and so it was a great way. Actually, it was so lovely, right? That we were all able to practice together when, you know, you think about it, we were so isolated at the time. Um, but they're still coming. And so I, still I love that. Online classes since they're COVID. still coming to the online classes. We have classes every day. I, I teach three days a week online. Um, I miss having bodies in the room. But because I'm set up, because we do a two-way live stream, so it's not live stream that is like you just 
put on a video and no one sees you. Like right. the way that we're talking right now, like I would be teaching class and I'll say like, Andrew, move your butt over to the right. <laughs> Andrew, ground your back heel, right? And so And so people are getting adjusted verbally and it's as if that I was in the room with them. Um, to like to further answer screen? your question. Sorry, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I have a giant TV monitor. And so, you know, I'll probably date myself. But if you remember Hollywood Squares, yeah. <laughs> it's like Hollywood Squares on the Zoom, right? And how do you, how do you see me in a little tiny box? I'm like, well, you're like, you know, you're like a six inch by 10 inch box on my, on my monitor. Um, and so it's been so nice to maintain the connection and to really see the growth of the for the students to see their own growth. I had it. I had a class because I'm doing um doing a more core March theming, and I'm cool. teaching this one class on Tuesday that is a hybrid of strength training and yoga. Mm -hmm. And I had a student tell me after class yesterday, he's like, I was standing up straighter after class. My hip didn't hurt, and now when I wait for the elevator in my building, I'm not hanging on like leaning back and hanging on to that railing like I'm actually finding my Tadasana where I used to always favor one leg or his back would hurt. Um, and so it's moments like that, that are like, uh, makes my heart just like get three times bigger, like Grinch like in, the, in my chest. Do you, do and I love that old model of finding a guru and staying with them because, you know, again, variety, there's something great about variety and being able to do that, but to have a teacher that actually, and, you know, I tell students all the time, like, find a teacher you love, find a teacher that helps you and stay with that person. I mean, not necessarily it has to be me, but it has to resonate with you. It has to challenge you, right? Because I don't think anyone comes to yoga to stay the same. Hmm. Yeah. Yoga is a transformational practice. It is, right? It's like therapy. People come, go, people go to therapy, you know, when their life falls apart on some level. Although and they realize it's not working anymore. I sometimes wonder, I mean, I, I think therapy is good. I'm not against therapy, but we you do have to look at the kind of like the relationship and whether or not it's becoming, whether or not it's actually transformative or whether or not it's creating a, um, a kind of attachment to, you know, like, like whether the incentives are aligned uh, in that sense. Sorry, that's another right. I know, but I, I, that's you know. a whole other that the whole business model is like you want to keep them there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, with, but with but yoga, that plays into. Sorry, go ahead. No, I just was going to note that something you shared with me before, and I th I think that there at this point now in America there are lots of teachers who have been teaching for twenty plus years, and when you've been teaching a lot for twenty plus years, especially if you used to own a yoga studio, like people that used to own yoga studios in the early 2000s, they taught thousands of classes, right? Um, and so you've seen bodies so much moving through these postures. Mm -hmm. So do you feel like even when you're seeing someone on a six by 10 screen, which is not too, too small, it's like your subconscious is maybe seeing way more than what your conscious eye is seeing and you're able to give them a cue. Like, do you, do you have, have you had that experience? Oh yeah, all the time. That's, that's how I see a body. Yeah. I, I right? think that, I think that that's something that for those listening, like when you're taking online yoga classes, there's a couple different options. Like you have, you can just take a practice. That's just a, something you do, you know, it's free, it's on YouTube or whatever. Or if you're taking class with a teacher, maybe they're just acting as if they're doing the practice, you know, and maybe they're creating an energy field. That's nice to be in. But then I think there's a third option where, kind of person like like you, Kari, is actually able to give them feedback in the real moment online. And would you say that, what do you think that takes to be able to do that? Oh, um, well, you know, I'm not sure because it actually comes pretty easily to me. And I'm not sure if that is a result of me teaching for so long. I, I think that the yoga anatomy has a lot to do with it um, and the yoga therapy, just understanding how a body works or should work, understanding the cliches of um, bad posture, hmm. right? And how that translates. And um, I think the Reiki helps me as well because I really like look at everyone in terms of energy and where it's hmm. flowing and where it's not because that 
literally, you know, in yoga, they talk about the chakras. It's just the endocrine system. It's just the chakras are the glands, right? And so where is there a squish? Like what organ is being affected? And so you can cue it musculoskeletally. You can cue it esoterically. You can cue it in the sense of like uh, um, expanding a kidney to open up an eye, you know, or breathing into one lung to expand the opposite kidney. Um, again, that goes back to like the Chinese medicine and the creation cycle and the seasons. And so it's, it's, it's so vast and so rich. Um, and really what you're trying to do is give the student a different experience because if they knew they would already be doing it right. Mm -hmm. As a teacher, you're looking for where they're not going for, you're looking for their blind spot. You're trying to help them hold a pose differently than the way they always hold it together. And what is a very big tenet of Katona yoga theory is that, and true in life, it's our strengths that become our weaknesses, hmm. right? It's what we overuse that eventually breaks down, right? Our body is, we're, we're made of nature. We are organic and that means we're going to fall apart. <laughs> and really we want to do yoga to keep the bot, to reframe ourselves and to keep reorganizing ourselves because life is disorganizing and disorienting. And if you were just to be pulled by the slings and arrows, as Hamlet would say, right, of your life. It's like, well, that's why so many people are walking around like bent and broken and, you know, like they have the weight of the world on their shoulders. And so every time you come to the mat, if you're doing a downward facing dog like this, you're not necessarily helping yourself. You may be speeding up the process of a bulging disc or a torn rotator cuff, right? And so that's how I see everybody, each individual. I like that as an idea of just when you're seeing students, you're looking at the energy that they're they're emitting in the sense of almost like the mood or the effective state within the posture, not just the anatomy of the posture. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you also mentioned just now, and this is on your website too, like organize yourself. Right, I, I forget exactly how you put it, but like, is that something that has been more of a, a more recent awakening of yours, how we are all just, there's a lot of chaos right now. Does it feel more chaotic? Is it just me? Like, is that, is that what you were kind of getting at that people feel maybe more chaotic because of, you know, I rant on this all the time, but like the smartphones are just disorganizing our mind constantly. Yeah. Like what is I it? I call about? them dumb phones. Tell us about the dumb phones. These are the dumb, the dumb phones. Phone. They're making These everyone stupid. Dumb motherfuckers here. They're making us dumb. <laughs> Tell us what it, what what brought you to bring use that language like organize yourself. Were you or, always an organized person, or is this something that's kind of been recent for you? No, actually, I have to fight to be an organized person because I have a lot of um, I have a lot of chaos in my life. I uh, I live on a farm with like thirty rescue animals, so I have eight dogs and two cats that are like in the house three teenagers. There's nothing, <laughs> there's nothing suffolk. <laughs> and how many cats? Two cats, just two. Oh, just two cats. <laughs> just two, what but I'm really cats? a dog person. Um, so I, so I'm definitely not organized, but uh, to quote Donna Karen, who was one of the founder of Urban Zen, we're always trying to find the calm within the chaos. And so mm -hmm. I think that when you're organized, right? If you're the eye of the storm, to keep going with another metaphor, it doesn't matter what's spinning around you. That you have, again, that equanimity, right? It's Tadasana in every pose. Really. Um, and so I just had the insight of organize yourself. Because I think it is like a call to action. And, you know, you, you're, you, you had me on the edge of like going down a wormhole of saying, you know, it's, we're in, it's more chaotic now. It's absolutely more chaotic now, mm -hmm. right? There's so much coming at us. There's so much with technology. We don't have a structure of like a nine to five work life anymore, right? We're available all the time. I mean, you remember, you used to just go out to play. You'd be home for dinner at six o'clock. Like your mother didn't know where you were, <laughs> right? Um, it's, I don't think, um, I mean, that's a, that's a whole other topic, but it's, 
very chaotic. And I think we are seeing that in the breakdown of our society and our morality in a lot of senses. So if you can, if you can have that calm in the chaos, if you, you know, real power, which is what yoga was really about. If you think about the ancient yogis, I mean, they were fierce. They weren't kind. <laughs> they had skulls around their neck. You cross the street. You know, they used to hold their arm up for three years, three months, three it weeks, three days, three hours. Yeah. Right? Austere and, and these practices. They were trying to leave their body. I think the, the joy of yoga is to have joy in the body, right? It is the absence of dis-ease in the body. Um, life is beautiful. Life is joyous. And so we want to, we want to make effort and we want to get results from that effort. And so there's people that tend to, um, work so hard and not achieve a lot, right? But you think about spinning your wheels. And so if you are, if you are organized and you have all of your faculties and all of your, you know, if you're organized and stable on the bottom, if you're capacious in the middle, and if you have a big vision, which going back to that cell phone, it's like our antenna, like the pituitary, the pineal gland, everything that is like getting that information, the inner seeing, the inner knowing, your, your intuition in yoga. It's like a whole world that we're not tuned into from having the phone. And I think that it's made us very myopic as a culture. How, how are you combating that? And I know you have, I know your kids are now a little more grown up than mine, but how have you tried to combat that, the power of the phone as the kind of black yeah. hole sucking in our, our consciousness? Um, um, do you think that people have to figure that out on their own and, and walk away from it? Well, I think that there's a whole, uh, there's a whole movement of like, wait until eighth, like wait until eighth grade to give your kid a phone. I mean, why would you let them walk around with a, with a computer in their pocket or, a, or, a, you know, the whole internet? Um, there's a wonderful book by Gabor Mate. I'm, you probably heard of him. He mm. does the whole podcast. I mean, like he is a guru to me. Mm. Um, the book is called hold on to your kids. And mm. I literally send that to friends or my niece is like a new mom. Um, it gave me a validity and permission to parent the way that I wanted to and felt in my, in every cell of my being was right. And my oldest daughter didn't get a cell phone until ninth grade, the middle one, a little bit younger. And, the, and it's still a constant conversation that's happening in my house and uh, an awareness. And then sometimes it's still like, Bodie, put your phone away, put your phone down. <laughs> you know, we don't, it's not, it is like so ubiquitous in the country and it's um, or the world really. And it's how teens are communicating with each other. So it was, you know, it's, a, it's a, the culture of your family has to be first and what mm. works for you. Um, but you know, there's so many studies that have come out, like just having the, the EMFs for the kids, like their brain, their skulls aren't as protective as ours. Mm -hmm. And just having that, that radiation, like you just want to lay that as long as possible. Also just the links to the, you know, FOMO and imposter syndrome and low self-esteem. And I mean, all of that stuff, the comparison trap. Um, it's just, it, there's nothing, there's nothing good. You know, yeah. you only good can happen by the longer that you wait. And I literally have a t-shirt that I got at a Wonderlust festival. There was this great company. I think it was called folk religion. Oh uh, yeah. Um, I have a t-shirt. Uh, oh, uh, it was called something as folk. Like they had, I, I know exactly what you're talking about, but go ahead. Go ahead. We'll, yeah. We'll, we'll, I have a t-shirt that says, hold somebody like you hold your phone. <laughs> Right. We pray to our phone all day long, you know. Yeah. <laughs> what, uh, I got yeah. that from um, Gopi Khalil. From he's like he was a, one of the big shots at Google. He talked about this as like an extra organ, you know. It's like that we pray to it, you know, like it's the Bhagavad Gita. But um, meanwhile, I, all those all those execs at Silicon Valley send their kids to a Waldorf school. Yeah, they don't let their kids have phones. I mean, 
I'm <laughs> I'm in that my kids are uh, about to be 10 and 7 and um I'm have you familiar with Jonathan Haidt, the author Jonathan Haidt? He's a NYU Not professor. really. I know you're also okay. NYU, Did you know you and I are both NYU yeah. alums by the way? Oh, I didn't that's right. That's amazing. Yeah. Um Jonathan Haidt is an NYU professor that does a lot of research on um, phone usage uh, and social media usage among teens in America. And his basic findings were that, you know, he, he was tracking the um, increase in suicidality among uh, teens in America. Um, and the main thing he found, so I'm just going to get my audio a little better here. Um, the main thing he found was that uh, girls, social media was causing girls to have way more self-image problems and to the, and was the number one associated um, cause of suicidality. Like the, the, the increase in suicidality among young girls was mostly related to social media use. Um, or there was like a direct correlate you know, from 2014 when Facebook um, really started taking off and Instagram Every time there was an increase in teen girls' usage of social media, there was an increase in suicidality. Um, and then additionally for boys, it had more to do with video games um, uh, as the kind of major culprit. You know, it sounds like you've been, you know, dogs and animals are very important to you. Um, you know, we just heard your dog barking. How did you get into Doga? How did all that start? And where did your kind of, love for her animals start and how is that related to your yoga practice my love of animals started in the womb <laughs> for sure um and i've always always loved animals i mean my mother would put me in a petting zoo and the lamb would come over and like you know nibble on my shirt and i would just be in bliss and you know growing up in the suburbs of toronto i was um, deprived. <laughs> but she would say to me, I finally broke them down when I was eight years old and we got our first dog. Um, but she would say to me all the time, when you have your own house, you can have as many animals as you want. And I have absolutely fulfilled the prophecy. <laughs> so thanks mom. Um, yeah, I've always, always for a long time when I lived in New York city, I used to teach Doga. I would go and volunteer every week at Bidawi, which is a no kill shelter on the East side. And I taught a doga class there for people and their pets and the, all the proceeds would go to help the shelter. Before that, I would walk dogs at the New York ASPCA. And then I got my first dog who actually her birthday was just, I mean, well, she's been gone for a while. Um, but when I was 25 years old, I got my first dog as an adult. And then two years later, I got a second one. And that second dog was really the founder of Doga because he had a lot of separation. He just loved me and had to be with me all the time. And there was a yoga studio. I don't know if you know it. Do you remember Bhava Yoga? It was uh, Peter Rizzo was one of the senior Jiva Mukti teachers. Rizzo, and he opened movie. up his own studio. Yeah, yeah. He was just a couple blocks away from my apartment. And so I would go with my dog, Charlie, all the time. And Charlie would just lie on my mat or like right beside me. And he would literally like lie on his bag and have his paws up the wall. And, you know, the Jiva Mukti adjustments were so good. And like, so deep. it was such a deep practice. And he would come around and he'd be like, oh, Charlie has his leg, you know, he's in Vipriti Karani with his legs up the wall. And he would like adjust to give Charlie a little scratch. Um, and then that studio closed. And really, that was the impetus for me to open up East Yoga because I wanted to be able for Charlie to do yoga. And he wasn't allowed at any of these bigger you know, more corporate like studios. I also wanted to keep the community together. So it was, it wasn't, was it, there was an altruistic the part too. Where, yeah, it was in the East Village. East Village. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember yeah. it. So you were so it was on 2004 to when? Um, until Hurricane Sandy, actually. Oh, yeah. So when it got totally flooded, uh, the waters from the East River came all the way to Avenue B, flooded the basement. And uh, let's just say the landlord was not above board. It started a fire. So the um, the studio burnt to, burnt to a crisp. And the only thing left unharmed, I had this big statue of Shiva <laughs> like, on the altar. And it's like, yes, you know, the from the destroyer, he'll ruin everything. But Shiva was still standing. 
Um, at that point, I had I had taken on a partner, and then she had taken it over because at the, by that point, I had my third kid, and we were living in Sag Harbor, and so so she moved the studio down to Sixth and B, and it lasted another few years. So I think it closed in twenty twelve. So yeah. so you had so you were the were you the first in your are you aware are you aware of anyone that was doing or kind of calling it Doga or before you? Are you the founder of Doga? Yeah, I mean that is the, so. I am. I am the founder. Of Char, I say Charlie's the founder of Doga. I was just his person. <laughs> um, I do know that there was a woman. I think her name was Susie, who was the yoga coordinator at Crunch Fitness, and so she, they had started. She did like rough yoga, and I actually taught a couple of classes. Rough, um, rough. Like R U F F, right? Rough yoga, but you know it was more of a. They always like they did it in the park. Of course, you couldn't take them into Crunch Fitness. It was always like some outdoor um, thing. But I'm I'm the one that had a weekly yoga class in my studio, fun day at four o'clock, right before my before my six o'clock two hour class that I would teach. And um, wow. yeah, how did that turn into the Animal Planet show? How did that happen? So. Um, so a lot of my publications that you'd said, like she's been featured on in this and, and on this program, this program, because it was, it was a, you know, it was like a media tidbit. People were fascinated with it. I loved it. Um, which I was a lot of pushback too. I was at the audience at the time and everyone was like, yeah. oh, Doga, how dare they, how dare they besmirch yoga with dogs. Right. I know. Well, it was the same thing of like, what, like beer yoga or wine yeah, yoga or like yoga hot yoga, yoga, like all of these things now. Yoga but is probably not as good as dog or goat yoga, but yeah, exactly. People send me the goat yogas all the time. And I'm like, that's why I got goats. Life goals, people, life goals. Um, yeah. Like I was going to say, those are really like anti of what you're trying to do to clean up the body and treat it, you know? Um, but the dogs, and it's so funny because there would always be like the camera guy that got assigned to it, you know, and I think then he would be like, you know, roll his eyes like the people probably at Yoga Alliance would be like, oh, my God, I have to. This is like my assignment. And they'd walk in a skeptic and they would film a class or film an interview with me. And every single time at the end, it would be the cameraman or the mic guy. They'd be like, that was the best thing I've ever seen. Right. Because the dogs, at the beginning, they're greeting each other. And like, da, 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 da. <laughs> but they get time on the floor with their favorite person in the world. Right. Like who loves you more than your dog? And so for you to like give back to them, we know, we know the symbiotic relationship of having a dog, right? There's so many studies. Owning a dog lowers your heart rate, lowers your blood pressure, increases heart rate variability, right? It has that like rest and digest. Yeah. Yeah. But the amazing thing, Andrew, it happens for the dog too. Hmm. Right? And if you think about how most people interact with their dog. Like they come home and they're so excited to see you, right? And you like maybe like, oh, no, 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 no. And then like the mail has to get opened or the text goes off or even people that are walking their dog. How do you see people walking their dog? With their phone. Now. AirPods in, yeah. talking on the phone, doing, you know, listening to a podcast. Like how many of them are actually like interacting with their dog the whole time? Whereas in the Doga class, you were. Right. And, and so it was this great point, like, thing. You said we all want to be seen like even our yeah. dogs. Yeah. But yeah. also like <laughs> I even said this in my show because um, wouldn't it be amazing if everybody greeted us the way our dogs do when we walk in the door? <laughs> yeah. That'd be great. Right. <laughs> right. Like I was like, Andrew, it's so great to see you. Oh my God, I haven't seen you since we had coffee a few weeks ago. Right? It's like, th- there would be no mental, you know, there would be no disconnection. Yeah, you, if, um, it's so funny. I just had the weirdest thought. I'm rolling my eyes because when I was like a Taoist yogi in this high demand spiritual group, others could call it a cult, <laughs> but like one of the things <laughs> we were taught is whenever someone entered, like the yoga, the yoga studio or the, the space, you greeted them like that yeah. because that makes them want to come back. And I mean, <laughs> that, so it could be used in a bad way to manipulate people or whatever, but 
I, I think the reality is just as you're saying that if we greet each other, it makes people feel so one. It's such a wonderful thing to be greeted. Wonderful. By. Um, it's such an acknowledgement and a, and a validation of your existence. Yeah. My, I don't know if right? you've, ex well, I, I used to leave, go home, I'll leave and come back from work a lot. And my wife kind of like trained my kids at a young age to do that for me. Like, daddy, like, and like, it's one of the best things ever. They're now getting to the age where I don't get that as much, but like, uh, I'm very grateful to my wife for that. Um, yeah. And, we did the uh, same thing with my kids and I still do it when my kids walk in the door. <laughs> I mean, you do it for them. Like you're now. There. Yeah. Yes. Oh my God. Yes. I think that's a really good thing. Regardless it's like, of... notice you're home. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. okay, so you... In fact, so, so Gary, I just, how did oh, sorry. Show... Okay. No, finish your thought, but then tell us how did the show get started? How did you get asked to be on the show? How did that, how did you come up with that idea? Like what was the show like? You know, what was that about? Um, Okay, so so what I was the story I was trying to tell you before is that um, because it was something that I would get a lot of requests about to do an interview or a thing, I was featured in the New York Times as like five different things to do in New York City, and so the yoga class was one of them. Now it happened to come out on a Friday mm -hmm. when this producer who was on his way to D.C. to pitch or Maryland actually to the Discovery Networks, he was on his way to pitch a television show to Animal Planet. He read the article, had recently lost his dog, who was like his best friend. Hmm. Um, and he walked into my studio. And he, I was, you know, happened to, he came during, right before class and he walked in and introduced himself. And then my dog, Charlie, got up and like walked around and like greeted him. And he fell, as everyone, fell in love with Charlie. Um, and completely scrapped the idea and decided he wanted to pitch this show of me and Charlie going around New York City, meeting different people who were doing fun things with animals and dogs and and then tying it into the yoga studio. And so that was really it. And they, you know, we filmed a teaser like the week later or two weeks later and he shopped it to Animal Planet and and then Canine Karma was born. <laughs> wow. And did you do just one season or more, multiple seasons? We filmed 26 episodes. Wow. So, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Has and I was pregnant now? with my oldest uh, daughter, with my oldest child at the time and like newly pregnant. So we were filming trying to like, before I was getting too big. <laughs> that was fun. I think that's cool yeah. because I think that when you follow your passion, like you have, you know, sometimes really amazing things happen for people when they do that. Um, you know, bring literally, Andrew, you said I went to NYU and I went to Tisch, so I was an actress, oh, right? Yeah. And so I did the whole like theater, you know, slog waitressing thing in New York City, and I've loved animals since I was tiny. Like that, that really, those are my passions, right? And then yoga became my passion. I was already practicing it, but I didn't go into my first teacher training until after 9-11, right? After, like, as mm -hmm. I was in New York, that was really the inflection point that took me down a whole different path. So years later to have this, like my three things that I love most in the world merge together was uh, a true testament of like following your passion and the rest it will just work itself out. It's, it's amazing. Yeah, in, in the Gita, Krishna says, um, you know, for those who practice yoga, you know, you're, you never, you never lose the ground that you've gained. And then if you die before you reach enlightenment, don't worry, you'll be born into a new life where you'll get to kind of pick up where you left off. And, uh, you know, you get, you, you'll have a more blessed life, you know, you'll get, you'll, you'll live in a house where you'll get to practice yoga, or you'll be reintroduced to yoga teachings. And I'm curious, do you believe in all do you believe in uh, reincarnation, past lives? Um, do you believe, you know, you've had a very blessed life. I think you'd agree that with that, like, what, where do you stand on all the spiritual side of the yoga practice? And what do you think of, of some of the beliefs that are connected with yoga practice? I absolutely believe that there is more after death. <laughs> and I believe in previous lives. I mean, there's, 
just have you seen a couple of those shows of those young children that like have these experiences and then they really figure out like they were this person well, three lives ago or whatever. Um, it's really magical, right? And yoga is magic. We do the practices to be able to tap into that something that is greater than us, but really what is really deep within us, right? It's like Om Mane Padme Om, right? Hail to the jewel that sits in the seat of the lotus flower. Like that's, we are all that essence, whether you want to call it source or universe or higher power. We all have, we are all, all are a tiny bit of God, right? We are spiritual beings having a human experience and I love the, the idea of like being able to pick up where you live off. I, I feel to go back to the animals, you know, in the morning there's chores. There's a lot of, <laughs> there's a lot of chores that have to happen in the morning before coffee. Um, and for me, that is a spiritual practice, right? Mm -hmm. Going out and letting the chickens out and filling the water. You know, it's like, you know, before, before enlightenment, chop wood, carry water or do the dishes after enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. It's a meditation in motion for me every morning and a real uh, opportunity for me to sit in the abundance and the joy of the life that we've been able to build here and what we've been able to do to help, to help others. There's like, five dogs just to my left here right now. <laughs> well, I hope they, if they join the screen, we'd love to see them. But, <laughs> what, you know, you mentioned earlier that like the ultimate purpose of yoga is insight. Um, and then you just shared a little bit about kind of treating your, your, the practices of feeding your chickens and, and all the chores related to being a mother and being a business owner and man, and having eight animals or more, it sounds like. Um, what, uh, you know, and, and then that, that mention of after enlightenment chopping wood, what is the, have you had an experience that you would say was enlightening or was enlightenment? What's the deepest insight that you feel that you've experienced as a yogi mm -hmm. and as a human? I've definitely had glimpses in pranayama and in meditation where the body just falls away, right? Like a, like a very deep shavasana, right? Where the, where the perimeter kind of dissolves and you can feel like spirit just expand out to the universe. I've had those. And then it's taken me years to get another glimpse of it, but, <laughs> but I've had those. Mm. Um, I think that that has been a true um, spiritual moment for me, but I've also had them on a hike, right? Or in, in, a, in a travel, like a, in a sunset, being able to see the ocean and the sun coming up in the ocean and like, jaw dropping, you know, awe inspiring beauty. I think there's spirituality in that. So would you, would you say that like your spiritual, the spirituality is these experiences of appreciating beauty and maybe the unknown? Um, is it, is it more than that? What, what's the final destination for you when it comes to your spiritual or religious beliefs? Oh, I don't think there is a final destination. Mm. Um, but when you were formulating your question, I had the insight of that it always, anytime I've had a glimpse, it, it is always around slowing down. Slowing down. Yeah. Right? To tie it back into you think like a life has gotten more chaotic, and it really has. And time speeds up the older you get <laughs> and time has sped up in our society as a whole. And it's always about, I think that's also why, you know, 
and there's no holiday when you have a farm. <laughs> mm. There's no federal, there's no day off, right? You either have to have someone come and do it or you have to do it. And it's really in the morning, first of all, it's just so helpful because it helps me with my circadian rhythm. I'm outside for 20 minutes to a half an hour when the sun is rising, right? Yeah, and so it's like a win-win. Yeah. Sun night and the red, you know, the slow wave. Um, it's, it's a beautiful moment, but it can also be drudgery for someone else, right? It's all about your perception of it. Mm. And that's where the yoga really comes in. Because I've had this conversation, I'm like, I, I don't want I don't want anyone going out there and feeding the animals or mucking the barn if they're not doing it with love in their heart because the animals will know as humans, we've lost a lot of that, but animals live in that, that energetic, that intuitive place, right? They have to, their survival depends on it. Um, a lot of humans have lost that connection. They have it when they're children, right? They're still, they haven't completely landed on earth. They still have a foot in the, in the celestial <laughs> realm. Mm. Um, right. They, they, they we've been, we socialize them to not trust that and to second guess themselves when really um, we should be honoring that and having them rely on that a little bit more, but the animals will know. Uh, do you talk to your animals? I do. Oh, I have mean, you not seen my Instagram? <laughs> it's to stay off Actually, I've seen a lot of you on Instagram. You have a pretty <laughs> epic uh, content team, I would say. You know, Kari has a lot of great content on YouTube, great content on Instagram. We'll put links in the show notes for all that. Um, this has been really awesome. Uh, I, I guess, uh, you know, we were approaching, we're a little over an hour, so I wanted to kind of give us a pause here and see, is there anything that you feel like we haven't talked about that you wanted to share or any kind of final, a dreg of wisdom um, from your life that you think it would be really valuable uh, to kind of end with? Um, I love that, that kind of, it seems that your philosophy has always been following what you love and even doing this hard work of far, having a farm, but with mm -hmm. love in your heart is, is a really powerful practice. Anything else you want to kind of leave us with uh, or plug at the end here? Um, I just, you know, thank you for the opportunity. That hour went by like that. Um, really great talking with you. And in your last question, I was like, oh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have said that that's really um, the lesson of my life, but I guess it is because I've never done the conventional thing or what was expected of me really. Um, and so, you know, it sounds hokey to say like, follow your bliss, but, um, be authentic. I'm mm -hmm. doing leading a mentorship right now. And I had one of the mentees ask me like, I think it was, his, I think it was a kind way of him saying that I'm very direct when I teach and like my voice can be, you know, uh, you know, it's that pizza nature in me. I just like hone right in. And yeah. if anyone's listening, who's a yoga teacher or a new yoga teacher, um, be yourself, you know, because if you're yourself, then your students will find you. If you're trying to be someone else, they won't. Yeah, and I think maybe uh, it's a hard thing to do in the beginning, but it gets easier and easier the more you do it. Yes. Well, okay, Kari Harendorf, thank you so much. Uh, this was really fun. We are going to put links in the show notes to all of Kari's um, stuff. Like you can try some classes with her. Uh, you can check out her YouTube or Instagram page uh, and her website. Um, and, uh, I look forward one day, I hope to make it to your farm and, and have all the animals surround me. Um, hopefully they will not be biting me. Uh, yeah, bring your kids. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So we're going to call it. And, um, 
we'll thank you very much. Uh, let's stay on with me before we go, uh, but we're gonna end now. Thanks everyone for this, for being here for another Dregs of Wisdom. Thank you.